Hey there folks, I'm Bryce Holdaway, co-host of The Property Couch, and today I have with me a returning guest. It's one of our favourites, Nerida Connersby, who's the Chief Economist at the REA Group. For most of us know it as realestate.com.au, estate, real but there's other ones as well. But uh, first of all, welcome back to The Couch, Nerida. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's terrific to have you, as always. I'm looking forward to having our chat today, but uh, we couldn't really start a conversation uh, about uh, between you and I without really sort of tipping our hat to the the US and the presidential election. And um, I'm, I'm super interested in your thoughts as an economist on what the change of power might mean, first of all, for our economy, um, mm -hmm. but then second of all, uh, a flow on to the property market. Yeah, okay. So maybe if I start on the economy bit, and um, the US aren't a major trading partner. Our, our economic fortunes are more closely aligned to China. So, you know, whatever China does from a sanctions perspective or from a political perspective does have a much greater bearing. Uh, but they are a big um, a partner, in, you know, a strategic partner in other ways. They may not be economic related, but it, it, they are partners in other ways. So um, I think that the main thing is, is stability. You know, we, we want to see greater stability in the US. It is a pretty divided country at the moment. Uh, the election was very close. You know, I think that was unexpected. I think a lot of people thought it would be a, a bigger gap between um, Trump and Biden. Um, so I guess overall, you know, it's good news it's over. Good news there's a decision. And, you know, hopefully it's, um, you know, there, there's a lot, the country becomes a lot more settled over, over the coming months. Uh, from Australian property, um, you know, not again, not a huge impact because, People in the US don't typically buy a lot of Australian property. You know, they're not like the um, like Asian buyers who have been um, a big determinant in terms of particularly of off-the-plan apartments. Um, but we can certainly see uh, we've certainly seen a big jump in property seekers from the US. A lot of search coming out of places like New York and California. I think you know somewhere like New York has been hit by uh, hit very hard by COVID. So, you know, that, that's had an impact. There's likely to be a fairly big expat community in New York as well. So that's potentially had an impact. Um, it's pretty similar to what we saw when Brexit was announced. We saw a big increase from the UK, similarly with from Hong Kong, when the, the extradition bill was announced, we saw a big increase from Hong Kong. So, you know, we do tend to see these fluctuations in overseas search on realestate.com.au when there are political situations that are a little bit unsettling. Uh, interestingly, I guess the big area that people from the US are searching is um, Byron Bay. So, you know, this is something that Byron Bay is just popping up everywhere at the moment. That Northern Rivers area is just so popular, not just with overseas property seekers, but people from interstate and, um, you know, locals as well. So, so that came in at number one, which was, um, you know, quite interesting, probably a little bit driven by the Hemsworths. And, I was about um, to say, Zach Stores in town. <laughs> He's built a shopping yeah. centre that he calls a house. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So then, you know, I think even if you add up all those US um, celebrities, you're probably going to be doubling the, the US-born population. So it's, um, yeah, quite interesting times up in northern New South Wales at the moment. Well, wow, it, it could arguably be the centre of the universe for Australia, though, because it's got so much going for it in terms of its um, its lifestyle. It's got really great climate. You've got an international airport just over the border, and then you're actually still within QE of a of capital city north and not too far south as well. So it's it's it, you can see why the appeal is. But I'm sure it's a nice segue uh, for us to talk about some of the uh, some of the changes that have happened through COVID. I think it's. There's a fair bit of press around people making decisions to go regional, but it, not all regional um, spots are the same, are they, in terms of being able to sustain over a longer period of time? Because I live on the surf coast here in, in Victoria, but the, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast are the obvious ones. But I guess wherever there's a winery or there's a bit of a foodie culture or if there's a sea change, they're the obvious ones. But um, the, the thing for me going forward is are... Will, will there be enough to sustain um, places that don't necessarily tick those boxes that are regional that offer a cheaper lifestyle? But, um, you know, will people back themselves to go there whilst they have a job or will they get insecure that if they ever lose that job, would they be able to get another one? So do, do you have a view on that? Yeah, look, it is interesting. I mean, we have seen this incredible level of search activity in regional Australia since COVID-19 and, and that's now translating through to pricing uh, we saw last week is actually translating through to population movement. So the ABS reported that they'd never seen so many people moving from capital cities to regional Australia since they've been tracking that data set. So, you know, there's no doubt there's this big shift that's occurring. 
Uh, I think, you know, what we saw prior to COVID was a definite shift to regional Australia. So, you know, we, we certainly saw that places, of, you know, like Surf Coast, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, um, <clears throat> moving down Wollongong Way, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, we're all doing really, really well, um, primarily a little bit to do with affordability and that, not because they're necessarily really cheap areas, but because people can get better homes, better lifestyle um, than, than what they can potentially get in a capital city. Uh, what I've seen since COVID is that's accelerated. So, you know, that interest in, in those areas has accelerated, but the level of interest has pushed out to areas that aren't within commuting distance to a capital city. So Orange in central West New South Wales is a good example, Margaret River, um, Byron, you know, the northern New South Wales region, even mid-north coast, basically mid-north coast, stretching all the way to the Queensland border has become incredibly popular. Um, places like Warrnambool, you know, Warrnambool's no, nowhere, you know, really hard to get to Melbourne or Adelaide, but, you know, that, that's seen some really good price growth. So, you know, I think it comes back to, you know, these areas, you know, they, they, it, it's great that people have discovered them, but it is also, there are a little bit at risk in terms of what will happen when everyone's called back into the office. A lot of us are still, you know, working from home. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's quite different still. But, it's, a, it's a good point um, yeah. you make, whether we will be called back into the office, because I think that will be the lingering thought that's going on just past those fringe commutable areas. And it's something that I'm particularly uh, keeping an eye on. You know, I am, I am the case study. I have escaped from the city. I love it. Um, but it's, and I'm seeing unprecedented demand in my own um, in my own community it's it's phenomenal uh, to be honest but um, it's just that longevity and I think there's potential that it can happen I mean it, you know we you and I are doing this interview via online meeting I mean it's just so normalized now that it's that it's possible but I, I still do have a uh, an interest to see how that will go sustain and going forward but um, you say this preference is uh, is fueled by two things. Uh, one is how we work, and two is the mining sector. How we work, um, you know, we're touched on that around the fact that we're we now work from home and I'm going to the capital cities like we once were. You made comment in in one of your blogs that Geelong, Illawarra, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, and Mandra they were already showing these signs anyway prior. But can you talk to us a little bit about um, uh, the, the the resurgence in the mining sector and how you see that sort of impacting that that shift away as well? Yeah, so I guess, you know, mining areas are always a, a little bit risky. You know, we've seen it in the past that people buy into them because prices are surging and rents are going really well and then the, the mine slows down or activity stops and then suddenly you've got, your you know, a price crash. So right now we can see places like Port Hedland doing really well from a rental perspective and also from a price perspective. Uh, Carapa is another one. Um, so, you know, those are areas that, you know, they do need more housing, they need more investment. But if you are someone that's wanting to go into those markets, just be, you know, fully aware that, you know, the pricing tends to go like this mm. as opposed to this, which is, you know, more of a capital city um, occurrence. Mm. Um, some really good news for, I mean, for some of the more interesting ones, um, I mentioned before, Central West New South Wales, um, there's there's a lot of gold mines in, the, in that region. So, Somewhere like Orange, around 25% of their economic growth is from mining, but it's also got a bit of a lifestyle element to it as well. So, you know, we can see um, at the moment on realestate.com.au that somewhere like Orange is now seeing more first home buyer inquiry than Kellyville in Sydney. So, you know, there's obviously something going on in terms of, of activity there that's, um, you know, sparking interest and creating jobs in that region. Um, Townsville is another one. It's, it's actually seen some price growth, but... You know, it's gone a decade of decline. So, you know, you do again. You've just got to be mindful that you know one one time period of a bit of growth often doesn't even offset the the declines that have taken place over over a prolonged period. I think the important point you raised there is, um, you know, for people listening to the audio, they couldn't see your um, hand going up and down, for, sort of for volatility. But um, I think uh, we've had uh, one of the leading sales agents on our podcast, who was based out of um, South Hedland, Port Hedland, and uh, recounted what it was like during the heady days, and then recounted what it was like during the dark days. Right. So it's almost like, and I'll, and I'll probably get shot by the people in these regions, but it's more, it's more of a it's more of a trade than an invest because if investing is more about sort of holding it long term, whereas that trading is seeing an opportunity and being able to do that. So for for the experienced investor, there might be some opportunities. I know that there's lots of vacancies in those areas that's fueled by these demand, 
Um, and as you, as you said uh, in in your blog, you know the fact that um, production of iron ore over in COVID affected areas over in South America make it even more internationally demand for what we've got, um, which is which has always been good, and now with that extra demand, so uh, approach it with caution. But there's clearly clearly there's uh, there's opportunity there with a bit of demand in that particular space. Um, uh, so. You, you, the big question we talked about is, will we be called back into the office? We don't know. Um, but you, you have a view that uh, the shift will be reasonably permanent um, going forward, uh, haven't you? Yeah. Look, certainly when you have a look at, I mean, you look at northern New South Wales. I mean, you know, that that's probably the area that's really benefiting right now in terms of price growth. You've got somewhere like Byron Bay where prices have shot up 30% in, th- in a three-month time period. So, you know, it's, it's obviously not going to keep increasing at that rate. It, it can't keep increasing at that rate. But um, but if you have a look at, I mean, a really good example is Bangalore in, in northern New South Wales. So that's, that town has actually seen the strongest price growth in Australia over 20 years. So more so than any suburb in any capital city or any other regional area. And it's increased from, I think it was around 70,000 median in 2000. It's hit now just over a million dollar median. So mm. it's a 1,200 and something percent increase, which is, you know, 14% per annum. So it's, you know, it's really, really big increase that we've, we've seen over that time period. So I think, look, I think it will continue, but I think um, obviously the price increases we've seen can't continue. And, and so, you know, that's, that's the, the difference. Um, the other thing, though, that really is driving it, not just northern New South Wales, but also Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, is a lot of movement from Victoria. So, again, coming back to this ABS data uh, that came out last week, they did see a um, the highest level of movement from Victoria to Queensland since the early 90s. So, you know, there's, you know, again, will that continue? We don't know for sure, but... Um, you know, in that March to June time period, which is basically early COVID, we saw a big movement to, to Queensland and um, and that is definitely benefiting places like Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast where, you know, we are now seeing some pretty record numbers in terms of search. We've seen a doubling in search activity, but we're also seeing very, very big increases in pricing, in, in particularly in some very expensive areas such as Sunshine Beach, which is in on the Sunshine Coast, mm. about to hit a $2 million, $2 million. median. Yeah. Wow. It's a, it's a lot of coin, isn't it? Well, um, <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> uh, well, well, I guess, uh, you know, watch this space, really. But um, uh, I just want to shout out to anyone who's, who's uh, listening or watching this. Just put a, a little note in the comments. Let us know if you're planning to move uh, regional and where. And we can see if we can get a bit of a poll with that happening as well. So uh, thank you for those insights. Hey, quick one with you on interest rates. Uh, cash rate is, uh, you couldn't see it uh, going this low and then all of a sudden it is. But um, monetary policy is, is is no longer a tool that can be easily used. Um, what, what's your feedback, first of all, on the fact that the rates are so low and the fact that the monetary policy is probably um, not as powerful at that level? And two, uh, we've talked about negative interest rates before. I'd be interested again now that we're even closer to to that. What what your view is on that um, for the benefit of our, our of our listeners? Yeah. Um, so um, obviously interest rates were cut again last week, which was another shot in the arm for, for property. You know, we we certainly see that any time they are cut, that that people do look to borrow more, and and as a result, that does help help pricing. Uh, the other things, though, that have happened, we have had uh, a relaxation of responsible lending rules, so, so that's really helping. Uh, we've also seen a lot of the job loss that's taken place during COVID be more heavily concentrated on young people as opposed to older people. So, you know, that hit, has hit the rental market very hard. Uh, and then, of course, we do have the banks, which are incredibly well capitalised at the moment. And, um, you know, we had the CEO of ANZ come out, well, not last week, but the week before, saying, you know, we've just got so much money, we don't know what to do with it, or, you know, no one wants it. Or you made some comment like that, which, you know, obviously is, is it's not an issue, but it just shows how unusual a situation we're in at the moment, that on one hand, we have this very bad recession and we've got very high levels of unemployment but at the same time there's no shortage of cash which is really propping up asset values across a range of investment types of which property is one of them. 
Yeah, and the fact that it takes so long to transact has also been a nice little buffer, and the fact that the banks have been so responsive has been helpful. But, um, yeah, I guess people still have this view that um, there is still some form of, uh, 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 well, it was called the September cliff, then it became the September slope, which then moved to March. I noticed the Prime Minister had a press conference today that was talking about how we need to sort of wean off the uh, off the support to try and stand on our own two feet again. So it'll be interesting to watch that space and see. But um, I think I think ultimately uh, what Australia, and we've said it along and it's almost, uh, you know, it's consistent and almost laboriously boring to say that the fact that we still have this strong under, underlying demand for, for real estate in most of our markets um, at, the, at the established level. And I can't see that changing too, too much going forward, given that you've got this demand heavily driven by owner occupiers. And not only that, you've got this, this um, group of people that are just outside affordability. So if anything sort of drops significantly, they'd be licking their lips ready to jump in as well. So I think that bodes well for our markets going forward. Um, a, a, another one for you, just, just in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, I was just sending me a question there. So another one in terms of property market observations, the Melbourne CBD could quite possibly um, be the, the the biggest challenge property market right now um, with the amount of vacancies. What What's your observations there? Yeah, so, you know, when we look talk about property, and it does seem to be tracking pretty well at the moment, despite conditions, but one of the areas of, of challenge, I guess, is the rental market. And most of, in most of Australia now, we have seen it recover. So, you know, very early in the pandemic, we did see a rapid rise in vacancies and big drops in rent, but, you know, this is sort of all flowed through now. It isn't so problematic. Um, one area, though, it is problematic is Melbourne CBD, and particularly the city, the suburbs that basically comprise the city of Melbourne, so, you know, including places like Carlton and Docklands and South Bank, uh, where we do now have around 12,000 vacant apartments in that, in that area. Uh, it has, um, inc- we always see quite a few vacancies at that time, but basically 4,000 up to about 12,000 currently. Uh, we also have, I mean, primarily the problem is foreign students haven't returned so you know this problem this bigger problem around migration is is a bit of a problem not I mean it is a big problem um but we've also got big problems with rental rates so retail vacancy we've got around 230 additional vacant shops the, the office vacancy rate has tripled um obviously this is absolute worst case yeah. because Mel- melbourne is now coming out of lockdown but you know if you want to look at one area that that is being the most impacted that is that is the one that is at the moment What's the epicenter, right? Because as you say, lockdown, no students, uh, the place is a ghost town. It's, it's, it really is the, um, uh, you know, the, the hardest hit and kind of goes for the teachings that we've always talked about in terms of making sure you don't put yourself in vulnerable positions where you're in medium and high density. Well, that's clearly a case um, where that's happened. Um, I've got a couple, uh, a couple of people letting us know uh, that someone wants to move from Sanford Village in Queensland uh, and another one has just moved from Melbourne to Bendigo. Uh, love our new town and so much more bang for our buck. Already made 80,000 equity in less than a year due to insane demand. And uh, Mitch uh, has said to us, Sunshine Coast is on fire. Interstate yeah. migration going absolutely nuts. And I must yeah, admit, Sunshine chatting... Coast. Sunshine Coast is crazy at the moment. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's up there. All the agents up there are saying it's yeah, record levels. Yeah, right press now. hard four copies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and typically sight unseen. So that's hey. What's your what's your feedback on some of the incentives that the the, the government uh, has offered? You know, first home buyer deposit scheme, the extension of home builder, and then also um, uh, talk a little bit about some of the mooted infrastructure spending that's been mooted for some time, and how you see that um, playing out as we try to recover uh, as we go through an economic recovery. Ah, uh, yeah. So obviously, great things like first home buyer grants are good news. Uh, for first home buyers, we can see it in terms of inquiry levels. It's it's been a pretty big year this year for first home buyers. So, um, so that's you know great good news. It's good news because you know that it's not often they get this. I mean, I don't think it's ever they've ever had this level of government incentive to buy. So it's um you know certainly very generous for them. Um, in terms of our home builder, you know we've similarly seen that primarily impact the house and land sector. So, you know, lots and lots of activity in the outer suburban areas. Many regional areas are doing pretty well off the back of that. So um, a little bit problematic in that we have zero migration from overseas and at the same time we're building more housing. So, you know, a little bit of an issue there, but, 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that at some stage in the near future we will be opening our borders again. So, you know, it won't be a long term issue, but um, a little, perhaps a little bit problematic in, in that we are building when there's, there's no new people coming into the country. So in terms of giving people some updates uh, from what you're seeing about the fact that, you know, students, uh, there's a couple of pilot programs for students coming in. And I guess as we get um, uh, get under control of the virus here in, in Victoria, given that we've got back to back days now without new cases, do you uh, do you see the government seeing that as a, a place that they would uh, bring forward? Or do you think politically it, it would be something that I would still continue to push off till next year? Uh, yeah, I think politically they'll push off. I mean, there's still a lot of Australians overseas that are trying to get back to Australia. So I think, you know, that's obviously the, the focus for now. But, um, you know, from, from an economic perspective, you know, we can certainly see for somewhere like Victoria, where, where education is the number one export, it's, it's particularly problematic, not just for inner city apartments, it's actually problematic for, for the wider economy. So, you know, I hope it will, you know, it'll get sorted out, but there's obviously this time period in which it is going to be a pretty big drag on economic growth. How long do you think that it would take for, uh, you know, as Australia looks to recover, clearly Victoria is behind that recovery, given the fact that, I mean, do you, do you uh, what's your commentary around the ability for Victoria to get back in alignment with the rest of the country? Or do you think that'll be some time? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you've got to think, it's the, Melbourne was, how many days? 100 days. It was mm. locked down. So, mm. you know, it wasn't it wasn't five years or, you know, it wasn't a, a, a huge amount. I mean, it was a huge amount. It felt like a huge amount of time for everyone in <laughs> Melbourne. But, it, yes. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't catastrophic for the economy. So, um, so you know, like, we'll, we'll see bounce back. You know, we saw it when, um, we saw it when Melbourne, sorry, when the rest of Australia reopened that we saw this big in impact on retail trade. We saw it in, we're seeing it in terms of activity already on, on, on our site on realestate.com.au. So, you know, I think people are wanting to spend, they're wanting to travel, they're wanting to do stuff and, um, and, and that will really help. You know, if we can maintain that confidence and that enthusiasm, Hopefully we don't lose too many people to Queensland, but um, but you know <laughs> if not, then you know will be it will be good news for the Victorian economy. Well, the challenge is just capacity, isn't it? You've got a, a scenario where you've got uh, the the capacity of a business. Say say even I notice around here in on the surf coast that all all this extra demand is coming, but they're still saying we well, need to line up and uh, have a booking, and uh, you know there's three yeah. to four to five people outside the restaurant compared to those who can be in. So whilst there's the demand there, they can't actually spend their money because they'll uh, they won't be able to do it in a COVID safe. So that's that's probably the biggest um, uh, help to recovery over time if we continue to uh, get on top of the health challenge nationally as well as in Victoria where more people can come into the restaurants, more people can consume, and therefore that'll have that multiplier effect, which will be really great. Um, now, I'm just going to quickly see here, we've got a couple of people saying, uh, what about the Central Coast? Woi woi to Gosford, just over and out of Sydney via the train, must be the next big boom. I don't think there's any secrets there. I think that's a bit like um, Mandarin, Perth, and the Sunshine Coast, yeah. the Gold Coast, you're on fringe commutable, so that's no problem. Um, Bendigo versus Ballarat. Benders is tipped to have much stronger growth in the next... 305 years. I think that might be three to five years. So we went there and I like the colder drive more. So clearly we've got a few people sort of giving us some feedback. Nice area is Ballarat going up as well. I think what was interesting is we had Scott Keck on our podcast and he has been a value of over 50 years. And he just said, look, just by geography, the fact that um, uh, Victoria is so small with such a big dense of population, he says he, he finds it difficult to even think of Geelong and Bendigo and Ballarat as outer Regionally, he's kind of, yeah. <laughs> regionally, kind of thinks it's just out the suburbs of Melbourne anyway, just because of the way that the geography goes. Hey, um, uh, easing of lending restrictions, so that's shifting the lender, uh, the responsibility from the lenders to the borrowers. So you don't have banks now having to pour over people's accounts and say, what did you spend that on, what did you spend on it? Sort of giving more responsibility back to, to the buyer. Um, and uh, I guess some of the feedback we've got, was, is that bad news, open slather for lenders, are they going to get a bit lazy? But I think... Uh, in the shadows of a royal commission and um, some 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 hits to reputation. Do you do you? I guess in the short term we probably see that they would be um, uh, reluctant to sort of colour out of the lines. But do you see that that uh, as that memory passes? Do you do you see that that would be a challenge? No, look, I think they'll be careful. I mean, they've just come through a royal commission. Um, there's there's going to be continued continued focus on the behaviour. I mean, what some people in the banking sector say that 
you know, the big four have, you know, they'll they'll toe the line and they'll be careful in the way that they land. But probably the bigger challenge will be some of the new emerging digital players. You know, they're, they're going to get pretty competitive and, and try to get market share, which um, potentially, you know, that may lead to a little bit more risky lending behaviour. But, um, you know, at, at this stage, I think that they will be pretty careful. It does... You know, I suppose fundamentally it is important that people do take responsibility for what they're doing, you know, and I think this is, you know, the I guess it's the, the whole argument of responsible lending. Is it the bank's problem or is it the lender's problem, you know, the borrower's problem? And, you know, trying to get the right balance is, you know, it's pretty challenging, I think, for, for government regulators. It's challenging, as you say. Well, people, we want to be treated like adults. Let us be treated like adults, and then you have someone who um, preys on people, which um, which which sort of counters that as well. So, but um, I guess uh, the environment that we're in, you know, when you and I were catching up last year, we we're having conversations around, you know, handbrakes and the fact that the property market was going um, too, too buoyant, and we we're, we're in a totally different world now. We actually need to be encouraging people to still have that confidence, so they can go out and spend their money and and, and invest. Uh, for those that are so inclined to do so that we can actually get ourselves out of the um, out of the recession that we're in. Uh, going forward, we obviously technically went re uh, into recession. Do you see, as we get the results for uh, the remaining quarters, do you see any other ones dipping into negative growth or do you think that we might have had that passed? No, I think it's passed. I mean, Victoria I slowed down a few few of the measures, but even with Victoria going into lock, extended lockdown, the, the fact that the Reserve Bank is saying, you know, we're, we're probably out of it now, is, it shows that the rest of Australia has been strong enough. Um, a lot of the data coming through, retail trade data that's coming through is, is, you know, it's not super positive, but it's better. And then you've got inflation, which is, again, not super positive, but they're not dipping like it did in the, in the June quarter. So... You know, there's there's certainly enough information now coming through to to show that we, we're probably out of recession, but there's still a lot of problems that we we do need to get through, and obviously COVID is one of them, and migration is another, and um, you know, borders shut borders, you know, all these things do need to be um, sorted out now, which you know will hopefully be early next year. I mean, there's this talk today of the the vaccine that's been developed being 90% effective, which again, isn't going to suddenly, you know, we won't all just get the vaccine and the problem solved, but, you know, it shows that things are in play in terms of mm. returning to normal, which is very good news. And, and I think what is good news too is that um, consumers are still pretty confident. You know, the fact that we see this massive surge in retail trade when people come out of lockdown shows that they, you know, people still want to spend and, and feel, you know, some level of confidence in the future that things will return to normal. Yeah, well said. So the last one for me before we wrap it up, um, Nerida, is uh, clearly when you have a property market that's been underpinned and largely absorbed, you know, the, the biggest X factor event I've ever experienced in my life and since back to the Great Depression. So part of that was because there was just a woeful lack of listing. So given that you are the preeminent uh, listing site in the country. Are there any insights that you can give us in terms of observations that you're seeing about increase in listings, not only in Victoria now that there's a bit of uh, scope to do that, but, but across the country? Because as we run around the country and buy in all different types of markets, the story's the same. There's, there's, there's not enough people selling. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's always, I mean, we always want more listings, obviously, but um, you know, it's better than it was. I mean, if we have a look at early early on in the pandemic, you know, the first two weeks of the, the, the lockdown, so the last two weeks of March this year, we not only saw a plummeting in search activity, and we, but we also saw a plummeting in, in listings. But what happened was um, search bounced back pretty quick and listings bounced back and, and you know, things started to improve. Um, Melbourne's obviously been particularly problematic because, uh, it was very hard to, to sell and buy in the pandemic with people stuck in the 5K radius and open for inspections banned, you know. So there was a lot of problems which, you know, we're hoping will will lead. I mean, it is leading to a, a bounce back in, in listing volumes, but obviously Melbourne has missed out on that spring selling period, which, you know, is typically the time in which we see the, the, the most activity. So, um, you know, I think... You know, as confidence improves, we typically see listings increase. So hopefully that happens over over coming months. 
expecting to see graphs in uh, internally there with your reports to see a big spike in listings in January that's uh, abnormal seasonally given that yeah, um, I do. Yeah. You, most of the agents you can't see them in Melbourne until Australia Day but I'm sure a few of them are kind, kind of looking at their uh, their forecast going maybe we might need to fill a few spots in that uh, January period. Yeah I look, um, it will be interesting I mean talking to some agents they do expect to be working through January, which is very unusual. You know, typically agents do take January off and, as you said, come back sort of towards the end of the month. But given, particularly in Melbourne, given things have been so quiet, I think there'd be some quite keen to, to get things moving and, and keep the, keep activity going through the summer. Yeah, no, I think uh, our, our team's gearing up for um, uh, for buying in January like they haven't at that time of the year before. So um, I'm sure that'll uh, translate into extra listings. Hey, look, it's always a pleasure chatting to you, Nerida. You're so generous with your time. Your insights are amazing. You're at the coalface of uh, economic developments around the country. Um, I appreciate you coming on to the Property Couch today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And for those folks that are listening, you can listen to The Property Couch each and every week, uh, Thursdays at 3pm, and you can check us out by going to thepropertycouch.com.au.